noticed all the Cancer Center ads on television and magazines lately? Well, they sound inviting and comforting, supporting and reassuring. What would you expect? They're ads. And ads are what? They're a way of trying to convince you to do something so that somebody can make some money off of it. So the idea is to recruit patients into these places so that they will have patients. Now, admittedly, some of this is to help people to know about some of the services they provide. But like you said, they're not really divulging all the details of what's going on. They kind of gloss over the bad stuff and tell us about the comfort and wonderful things that they do. Well, you know, too, you have to admit that they are pretty heavy on emotional appeal. But they're light on the facts regarding cancer treatment benefits and side effects and risks and the outcomes of their programs. And they rely mostly on patient testimonials and general messages of hope. Now, the results of a typical patient aren't disclosed, and they can deceive people into thinking that whatever treatment they accept is fine and just what they want. Now, mostly promoting conventional treatment. Yeah, well, conventional treatment is really where it is in the mainstream because of all the control uh, that the pharmaceutical industry has over uh, legislatures in the state. You know, in the past, we've made fun of some of the pharmaceutical ads and saying how they're, they're flowery with music and everything. You know, to me, some of these ads almost seem like they're ads for going to a spa. Oh, yeah, why not? Why not encourage people to come to our place because we'll make you feel good? And then they don't talk about you're going to lose your hair. You may have neuropathy. There may be nausea and vomiting. There may be all kinds of hemologic blood problems that occur. They don't focus on that and neither do the doctors. So what we have here is a system that's really dishonest. We're not looking at, at presenting people with the facts. We're really trying to sell them a bill of goods because we want them to come to our facility as well as we want them to get better. And people are scared when they go, you know, and, and they don't know what to do and, and they're because they're so frightened and they want to trust. They really want to trust. So these ads just fall right into that, into getting you to, to trust them. Sure. Well, when you're desperate, you found out you have cancer. It may be an advanced stage cancer. You would like to do something because all of a sudden this big bomb has dropped on your head and you, and you have to deal with it. It's not an easy thing. And if you can get comforting from somebody and you're not really educated yourself about what to do for cancer because, after all, you're just a patient, right? What would you know about the medical literature or what's on Google, you know, to find out some of the complementary and alternative approaches. So what would be some of the questions that a person should ask? Boy, that is really a good point. So many of my patients come to me and they say, well, I've decided to do chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery. And I'm saying, well, have you talked to the doctors about what the outcome is expected to be? How long will you actually live if you're an average person What's your life expectancy at 5 or 10 or 15 years? So the true statistics. The real true statistics of what to expect. And what the quality of life would be. Quality of life's a big deal. So Maybe, if it's worth it? Sure. I definitely expect uh, doctors to reveal the side effects. They call them side effects, but they're really the effects of the chemotherapy, the surgery, and the radiation. Because you deserve to know that. I see so many people that come to me with a neuropathy. And they, they, they walk with their feet up. I mean, it really looks like they're uncoordinated. They can't feel their feet. And sometimes they really have a lot of pain because of the, of the burning pain that they get, especially at night. And they say, I had no idea that's what I was in for. It's sort of like what the doctor is doing is trying to sweet talk you into doing a particular therapy that that doctor is really convinced is in your best interest in his mind or her mind. Not well, so much what's in your mind. Well, the other thing, too, is that many times a patient isn't really listening. Because oh, they're, they're in shock. There's, yeah, they're in shock. Now, think about some of these direct-to-consumer ads. Think yeah. about all the little side effects <laughs> they say. It's shocking if you really listen to that. Oh, yeah. But how many people really listen to it? Most people are just letting it go because it's an ad and they, they don't hear it. They just see the thing that sticks with them 
and that they remember are all the flowery things and the nice loving things. Well, that's and that's what happens with these ads for the for the cancer centers. Exactly. So it's and it's not just the cancer cancer centers; it's the hospitals that are doing things like this too. I mean, look at the Thrive program that we hear so much about uh, on television for Kaiser Permanente, and they're talking about how they are listening and caring and doing all the supportive work that they can. And maybe they're doing a better job, but hello, there's another side of the picture. And what about the doctors, the, the oncologists? Are they really being straightforward and saying, this is what you should expect if you have this treatment, and maybe you, it will be a real problem for you? We'll do the best we can to get you through, but it's not going to be a cakewalk? Well, sometimes there's a conflict of interest because the, mm. <laughs> the oncologist is making money off of your chemotherapy. Well, the oncologists that are working in private practice are. Those that are working for institutions like Kaiser or, or some of the bigger HMOs, Maybe some of the it's a different centers. story. Um, no, I don't think so. If they're working for a bigger organization, that money for selling the pharmaceutical drug will go to the institution. Yeah, I know I have friends at, at UCSF, and they tell me that that's what the deal is, and they wish they could make income from that, but they can't. But the other thing is, too, is that I think that it's the responsibility of an oncologist to know about complementary therapies for cancer so that their patients can make an educated um, decision. decision on what they want to have done yeah. instead of just narrowing it to chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery. And just conventional ones. I mean, it is absolutely, you're right, Vicki, it's absolutely the responsibility of a doctor to know all the possible therapies that there are for a cancer. You've got a life-threatening illness, and you're going you're to tell your patient, well, all I know are the mainstream treatments because we do scientific medicine, but we can argue about that because it's probably the worst, quote, scientific medicine on the planet compared to some of the other scientific medicine that's in other fields because we never have a control. So this is a, a huge issue that should be disclosed. So when we're looking at Having a life-threatening illness of any kind, especially cancer, it behooves us to know how to ask the right questions, to get second opinions, to find doctors who can do both complementary and alternative medicine and mainstream medicine because you deserve the best. And you deserve to be completely informed. A lot of the time what happens is we sign a statement saying that we have been informed of these particular problems that can occur, but when they actually happen, it comes as a shock. So do your homework, get the support you can from somebody that can help you to go through this process and find a doctor who's got a balanced approach to treating these kinds of illnesses.